He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Well, it's so good to be with you all today. My name is Joe Scavato, and I'm the pastoral resident here at Chapel Street, and was lucky enough to meet many of you last week and even earlier today, but just so excited to be able to share some of God's Word with you today. In fact, some of what we're talking about today were those verses you just heard and saw, and as we're going through this series on Colossians, we're encouraging our church to take time and memorize those, vers- those verses in, in Colossians 1, 15 through 17, just as we seek to understand and learn more about who God is. Those are some of uh, the best verses to do that. So we hope you join us in memorizing those. Hey, have you ever asked yourself a question as you look at a situation or as you looked at something, have you ever asked of something, is it enough? So, like, for example, when I got ready this morning, is what I'm wearing enough to keep me warm in this unpredictable fall weather where it's 40 degrees one day and 70 the next? When I go eat lunch later today, is it enough to keep me full for the next meal and also to keep me healthy? When I go to sleep tonight, is it enough to give me energy for whatever is coming my way Monday morning? Is it enough? I remember asking uh, that question of myself a while ago. Uh, It was my freshman year of college. I was 18 years old, and I don't know how you were when you were in that stage of life, but when I was 18 years old, I was sure that I was enough. I thought I had life figured out. I knew all of the answers to all of life's questions. And so I went to college, and my first semester, one of the classes that I took was an Old Testament class. And the professor that I had for that class was famous at our school. He had been teaching there for decades. It was just this incredibly brilliant guy who knew as much about the Bible as anyone I've ever met. And he was famous. His name was Dr. Williams. And Dr. Williams was famous at our school, not just for his knowledge of the Bible, but also for the difficulty of his classes. You see, I'd been warned by multiple upperclassmen who had survived his class that his entire semester was based on five exams, and it was almost impossible, almost unheard of, to get an A in Dr. Williams' class. But I was not worried. You see, Dr. Williams had never taught me, after all, and I had figured out all of life at the young age of 18, and so I was pretty sure I was going to be fine. And so about a month into the semester, I, we, we had our first test coming up, and I, I really was feeling so confident. I studied a little bit, but not too much, and I remember waking up that day just feeling so good. And, and one of my friends asked me even, hey, are you worried about this test? And I think I said something like, I'm not worried about the test. The test should be worried about me, which is like the worst thing you could say. <laughs> um, and, and so I remember I went to that class that day, and I sat down, and I took this exam, the first exam I'd ever taken in my college career. And then the next day, I got my grade back, and I got a D minus. It was the worst, worst uh, grade I'd ever gotten in anything in my entire life. And all of a sudden, I had to ask myself this question, am I enough? Do I have what it takes? Maybe there are people out there that know a little bit more than me at the young age of 18. And it's kind of funny now as I look back at it, but it really did become a defining moment in my college years, and it forced me to grow and mature in a way that I never had to before. Is it enough? I think so many things in our lives are built on that question, whether we realize it or not. The decisions that we make, the people that we're drawn to, even in my case, how we view ourselves. Is it, are they, am I enough? We're in the second week of our series on the book of Colossians, this letter written to this church that was trying to answer a similar question in their faith. Is Jesus enough? Is he sufficient? Is he who we think that he is? 
You see, this church in Colossae had been, had been raised up in the truth of the gospel, and they knew who Jesus was. And yet there were these teachers that had come by and had started to kind of teach this false doctrine and all these different ideas. And if you were here last week, Pastor Andrew talked about this idea of Gnosticism, these Gnostic teachers that would try to distort and try to twist who exactly Jesus was. And if you were here, you heard a lot about it. But just as a quick recap, for our purposes today, there are three things you need to know about this Gnostic ideas and and this, this teachings that they would give. The first is that they would try to patch together just different aspects of different faiths. And so they would say, you know, Jesus is fine. He's one option. That's good. But, you know, there's a bunch of other gods and a bunch of other faiths, and those are all fine too. And you can kind of just pick and choose what you want. He, he called it salad bar spirituality, and, and where you kind of just pick and choose what you want to be true and make your own thing, and it's equally valid as anybody else's. Second, they would teach that anything that is in this physical world that we live in is inherently evil. And so there was this tension of, you know, if Jesus is God and he is good, then how could he also have been a man who must be evil? And they questioned if Jesus really was a real person, if he really came and did what Christians believe that he did. And so this, there was this confusion about this idea. And then third, they taught that salvation comes not just from Christ, but that it comes from this kind of secret knowledge, this hidden wisdom. And, and you know, some people have it and other people, you just don't. And it's this idea of kind of like this insider's clubhouse mentality. It was like when my friends and I would hang out as kids and we would say, you know, no girls allowed, trying to like create this separation. Of course, for us, we were ignoring the fact that no girls wanted to hang out with us, but that's a different conversation for another time. In his, in his New Testament commentary, Curtis Vaughn wrote that Gnosticism did not deny Christ, but it did try to dethrone him. It gave Christ a place, but not the supreme place. And so it's with all that in mind that Paul is writing this letter, and he writes these words. And we're going to read uh, some verses here in Colossians 1, starting with verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the, for, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Those are some great verses to memorize and meditate on. Verse 18 says that he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. See, these verses have so much to say about Christ being sufficient, about him being enough. And Paul points us to three things that we can see in these verses. He points us to who Christ is, about what he has done, and about what he is able to do. And first we see that Jesus is before all things. He is before all things. As a kid, I always wanted to meet a celebrity. I thought it just sounded so cool and I'd have a great story to tell people. And I was a big sports fan growing up. And so my dream was to meet a professional athlete growing up. And so I remember one time, I think I was around 14 or 15 years old, and I was in the Orlando airport, sitting at a terminal there, waiting for a flight. Um, And I was just sitting there, and I saw someone walk by. And as soon as I saw him walk by, I immediately recognized him. 
He was a professional basketball player. Um, his name is Dwight Howard. And if you don't follow uh, basketball, he's one of the tallest players in the league. He's, I think he's listed at six feet, 11 inches. So just this crazy tall guy. And I had seen him play a bunch on TV, and at the time, he was one of the best players in the league. And so I was so excited. I started just like bouncing a little bit. I was like, oh my gosh. And, and so I, I knew I had to meet him. And so I walk over, and, and by the time I got to him, um, there was kind of a crowd had formed around him, and now I'm getting kind of nervous because, you know, what, what if I don't know what to say to him, and, and I want to make this guy laugh because then I'll have a great story to tell. And, and so finally I get to him, and I look up, and literally it's like looking at the moon. Like, he was so tall. And, and I, I go up, and I, I go to say hi to him, and every word I've ever learned in my entire life left my brain. Like, I, I was speechless. Like, I think I said, like, like, just making noises. Like, it was, it was complete gibberish. And this poor guy who just wanted to go to where he was going is looking down at this awkward teenager just, like, gaping at him. And I, he, I probably weirded him out, but he was very nice, and, and he put his hand out, and we shook hands. And as I did so, I literally like, couldn't see my hand anymore because his just, like, sur- it was like shaking hands with a bear. Like, it was crazy. It, it just surrounded my hand. You see, I I knew a lot about this guy. I had seen him play on TV. I had seen that very hand dunk a basketball countless times. But when I had an up-close and in-person encounter with him, everything changed, and it was overwhelming to me. You see, I think Paul is trying to do something similar as he writes this letter. This church that he was writing to knew a lot about Jesus, they had heard all about him, and, and yet there were these other things that were, they were trying to figure out, all these false teachings. And Paul is writing these words, and it's almost like he's saying, you know, this Jesus that you're hearing about is so much smaller than the real thing. And if you meet him up close and in person, everything will change for you. He is so much greater than you think, and all you have to do is look up. So Paul's answering this question, is Jesus enough? And he does so by reminding them who he is, but also who he is not. Verse 15 says that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He's the image of God. He's not some God that has been created by man. He's not, he's not something that, you know, someone thought, of, thought up of. It's the other way around. He is the image of God, the one that we have been made in that all creation comes from. He reveals who God is because they are of the same nature. Have you ever read a a book or or something where maybe there's a character in there that you kind of have this idea in your head of what they look like and what they sound like? And then maybe that book was made into a movie or a show or a play, and the first time you saw that character, it was just a little bit different than what you thought. I think there's something similar going on here where where Paul is writing, you know, you guys have this idea of who God is, and yet it is revealed to you when you see Jesus for the first time. These false teachers were trying to do all these things and discover this truth and figure out all of this knowledge to know who God is. But the truth is that no amount of information leads to your salvation. It is only Jesus who shows us who God is. He is the image of God. He's also crucial to creation. Verse 16, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Remember what was being said about Jesus, that he was kind of at the same level as any other God, and, you know, they all lead the same way. Something that's taught by many people even today you know, that all faiths are valid, and, and, you know, we're all kind of believing in the same God. And yet Paul speaks against that here, and he says, how could that be if Jesus is the one in whom we are all made? He was there when it all started. He was there when all these other false gods and these pale imitations were made. He's referencing here what John begins with in John chapter 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. See, he was there when it all started. 
He is the real thing, the firstborn over all creation, which isn't meant to be in the literal sense of being born, but it's more of an indicator of status, of Jesus being royal, of Jesus being worthy, of him being greater than all else. And yet so many were getting caught up worshiping the creation over the creator. This is like if I, if I gave you a picture of the Grand Canyon, and it's this beautiful picture of the Grand Canyon, and then I sent you to the Grand Canyon, and you stood there in that beautiful piece of creation, and instead of looking at everything that there is, you just looked at that picture. And you said things like, wow, this picture of the Grand Canyon is beautiful. I love this picture. This picture is breathtaking. When the real thing is right in front of you, And all you would have to do is look up. See, if all things are made through him and for him, then everything that we are tempted to worship, whether it's money and possessions or status or even ourselves, everything was designed not to be worshipped, but to point us back to him. And then verse 17 He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It's easy, I know, for me to at least think really big when we hear that that verse, to think of Jesus holding together the world, the galaxy, the universe, and that's true. All of it is held together in his power. But this isn't just about the world. This is about your world. The truth of this verse is that in the way that he holds the universe together, that is the same way that he is holding you today. That every part of who you are has been put together with intention. That there never has been a day in your life where Jesus has not held you with care. That as you're sitting here today, whether it's in a season of joy or sorrow or of highs or lows, maybe you're here today to be reminded that he has not stopped holding you. That he is walking alongside you every single day of your life. I think for many of us, maybe the reason that we look to things like rulers and powers and authorities for our hope is that the Jesus in our head is too small to be sufficient but he is so much greater. And if he can hold the entire universe together, he can hold you too. All you have to do is look up. He's before all things, but Paul continues and shows us that Jesus is also supreme over all things. Supreme over all things. I'm the youngest in my family. I have uh, one older brother whose name is Nick, and uh, like many siblings, uh, we grew up and we were very competitive in everything that we did. We would compete to see who could get the best grades, who was best at sports, who could eat dinner the fastest, uh, who could not get sick from eating dinner the fastest, all of it. It was all a competition for us. And even today, we find ourselves to be very competitive with each other. And one of the things that we do to compete in is whenever we take a family picture, we try to see which one of us looks the tallest. And so just a fun game. So I brought some examples just to show you. So go ahead and put the first one up. So this is us. Um, This is at Christmas time, as you can see. We're both adults. So this is something that adult men are doing. Um, Literally pushing the other one down, trying to see that, you know, and as you can see, I'm taller, okay? Um, Go ahead and go to the next one. Um, This is one of all of us jumping. We got our dad involved in this one. Um, And as you can still see, still the tallest. Just want that on the record. Um, Go ahead and put the third one up. This is actually from my wedding day. Um, And if you thought I was going to let him be taller the day I got married, you're crazy. I was going to win that one, and uh, that's just a little fun that we like to have together. You see, in many ways, that's just something that we do to, uh, to frustrate our parents during picture time. But, it, it, but in many ways, as I look at myself, it's also a reflection of how I live my life. You see, if I look at myself, if I'm honest with myself, there are places and areas where I want to be first, I want to be the best. I want to be the greatest, the tallest. And what my desires and preferences and plans are, so often those are the things that come first. Paul writes about that in verse 18. He says that he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in 
everything he might have the supremacy. See, Paul is emphasizing here that Christ is supreme. Supreme, this Greek word which can also translate to be first, to be foremost, to be utmost. Supreme meaning that what he says goes. And Paul ties this idea into not just who Christ is, but also what he has done. You see, he is supreme because he is the firstborn over death. He is the firstborn among the dead, the only one that has showed power over the grave. The only one that has died and not just stayed there, but has been resurrected. He has shown victory over death, and it is because of that that he is supreme, that he has earned that supremacy. And that supremacy over death has earned him supremacy over life. And what are his plans for life? Well, he shows us right here. It's for us to be a part of his church, to be a part of this body together, to be building each other up, to be following his commands and living in unity. And it's part of that body that we are reminded that all of this is not about us. It's not about what we want. It's not about what makes us comfortable. It's all about him. And this idea that we see in this book of Colossians, but also in our world today, where it's kind of like a do-it-yourself spirituality, where you just get to pick and choose what you want, that was never designed to be the answer. Because not only does Jesus have the answer, he is the answer. He is enough. He is the answer to the problems of our world, to the problems of our community, to the problems in our families and even in ourselves. And it is only when we follow him that we find our fulfillment. Paul doesn't stop there, though, because you see, if if Jesus is supreme over death and he's supreme over life, then the question is, is he supreme over you? Is he supreme over me? Do I see Jesus as enough, or do I simply see him as efficient? Do I see him as enough, or do I see him as efficient? Is he enough for me in any season of my life, if I'm doing great and it's my best day, or if I'm in my lowest moment? Is he sufficient for me, or do I simply see him as the way to get what I want the fastest? I remember struggling with this idea a while back when I started to feel that God was calling me to ministry, to to be a pastor, to serve his church. And there was a time in my life where I knew that this was God's plan for me, and I knew this is what he wanted, and yet I ran from that calling because I wanted to do something different. You see, in my immaturity, in my youth, I wanted to do something that maybe sounded a little more fun, or maybe a little bit easier, or maybe a little bit more exciting. And for the longest time, we had this battle for first place to see who was going to come first. And I tried to make this deal with God where, you know, I could do my thing and then I could also maybe like do his thing on the side and like maybe just volunteer or give money. And and I knew that's not what he had for me. And yet it's what I wanted anyways. And so for years, literally, we, we had this battle and I kept trying to do my own thing. And he kept asking me, why is my plan for you not enough? And eventually, all the things that I wanted started to either fall away or fall out of reach, and my selfishness started to leave me. And eventually, I came to the place where I could say, God, it's your plan and not mine. I had to realize that it's only when Jesus is my priority that my purpose was revealed. What about you? Is there an area in your life where you are fighting for first place with God? where you're trying to to push him down and trying to be tallest and trying to be first and trying to be best. Maybe like you, it's it's with your purpose for whatever season of life that you are in. Maybe it's with family or with finances, but whatever it is, the truth is that Jesus is not just efficient. He's not just here to give us what we want. He's not just here to give us comfort and to give us health and to give us happiness. He is sufficient, no matter where that leads me. 
no matter where it takes me, even if it leads me somewhere I never thought I would be, because he is supreme over death, and he is supreme over life. And that means he is supreme over every part of me. Paul finishes this passage with our last description of Jesus. He is reconciler of all things. Reconciler of all things. You can see as Paul is writing as he's kind of building this argument, this argument to speak out against these false teachings. And he talks about who Christ is and what he's done. And then here in these last few verses, he kind of pivots a little bit, and he talks about what Christ is able to do, to be our reconciler. And so verse 19 talks about this. It says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under earth, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. I love how Paul writes about reconciliation, about this act of being brought back together, of being in harmony together. And for Paul, this not just matters to the gospel, this is the gospel. The gospel that we were, as he writes, alienated from God, that we were enemies to him, and that he was enough to bring all things back to him. You see that phrase, the fullness of God, his fullness dwelling in him, and and that phrase indicates that there's nothing that Jesus lacks that will bring us back to him, that he lacks nothing to this process of peace. This peace that comes not from any knowledge that we can learn or any action that we can do, but it's only through his physical death and the blood on the cross. And Jesus stands there in verse 22, says, presenting you holy in his sight. I love thinking about that. About Jesus standing next to me, presenting me not for my sin or my shortcomings or my brokenness, but presenting me as free as pure, as holy, as blameless. See, that's the feeling that every person, no matter what they believe and who they follow, that is the feeling that they long for in their hearts, to be brought back together and to be free. And we come up with all sorts of different ways to try to to free ourselves. We try to be better and do better and do all these things to justify ourselves. It's the idea of just running around, and, and Paul gives the answer to us right here. In verse 23, he says it's not about running. It's about resting. Verse 23, do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. If you want to be reconciled, if you want to be free, all you have to do is do not move from what you have heard. Do not move. Do not let the world move you. Don't let your pain move you. Don't let the enemy move you. Do not move. It's like when I ask my wife if she needs help cooking dinner, and really the best thing I can do is just to stay out of the way until it's time to do dishes. Just don't move. Church, all we have to do in order to be reconciled with our God is to do not move to stay true to the gospel that we have heard, to stand firm in our faith, and to allow him to do what he is uniquely qualified to do. Reconciliation does not come from running. It comes from resting in his peace. A few weeks ago, there was a story going around. Maybe you've heard it. Um, There was a young man. His name is Brant. And Brant is an 18-year-old kid, and a couple of weeks ago, um, he kind of went uh, famous, he went viral, and um, it's because recently his brother was shot and killed by an off-duty police officer. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, the police officer was convicted of murder, and after the trial, Brant spoke up, and he did something incredible. He did something controversial. He did something powerful. He spoke up and he looked at the person who had torn his family apart, who had taken his brother away from him. 
And this 18-year-old kid spoke, in, and he forgave this person. He offered forgiveness. He looked at this person sitting there who, and no one would have blamed him if he had held on to his anger and his bitterness forever. He looked at this person who many thought deserved a harsher sentence than what she got. He looked at this person who many believed deserved no forgiveness. And he said because of what Jesus had done for him, he wanted to do something that she could never do for herself. He wanted reconciliation with her. He wanted to be reconciled. He wanted to offer his forgiveness to free both of them from their pain. It was this incredible moment, and, and it, was, it led to a lot of conversations, conversations about justice and about race and about violence, and all those conversations matter. But ultimately, this is a story of a picture of the gospel. This is a picture of exactly what Jesus does for each one of us. He does something that none of us are able to do for ourselves. He stands next to me, and he looks at me and presents me, saying, this is Joe, made in my image. And he rested in what he knew to be true. He could easily say, hey, this is Joe, and, and here are all of his sins, and here is all of his problems, and here is his jealousy, and here is his anger, but that's not what he does. He does something that I am never able to do for myself. He presents me as free. He is the reconciler of all things, and this is our hope today. That if he can bring peace to a family that has lost a sibling, a son, if he can bring hope to someone convicted of murder, then he is enough in any of our situations that he is enough to reconcile each one of us, our sin, our hurt, our brokenness, all of it is covered because he is enough. He is enough. And all we have to do is rest in the truth that we have heard. Let me pray for you. Father, we're thankful for this day and we're thankful for who you are. God, you are enough. You are before us. You are supreme over us, and you have reconciled each one of us. God, I pray today that you would allow us to rest in that truth and also to live with gratitude, with thankfulness. Would you allow us to rest in this truth today? Would you allow us to make you supreme over each one of us? We pray all this in your name. Amen.